Hello and welcome to another episode of The Lowdown. Today I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by Joseph Lowry of The Athletic and 361 Soccer to preview the upcoming MLS season. Joe, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Not at all. The pleasure is all mine. Um, Joe, in my own opinion now, for a few years, you've enjoyed a near monopoly over soccer writing in the US with your insightful, in-depth tactical analysis. Tell me, where did this passion originate from? I <laughs> mean, I'm not trying to use the word monopoly there. I think some other <laughs> folks would have some things to say about that. But I'm going to take it because they're not here and I am, you know? Um, where did it begin? I've always been fascinated with strategy and with the idea of how how teams approach games in any sport, right? Growing up, I watched basketball, American football, baseball. I mean, and then soccer as well actually came mostly later on in life. I was exposed to it, but I, I didn't actually really grow fond of it until, until a little bit later growing up. So but that I, that common thread of trying to figure out what was actually happening on the field or the court or whatever, fill in the blank sporting venue here, right? That, that passion was always there. And so when I kind of discovered soccer, I had always known it existed, but when I really started watching it, I think it was, I, I don't remember when it was exactly, but I, I found this appeal of there being so many players on the field and there being so many things that can happen during a game, which is a challenge in soccer when you're trying to quantify things that happen, unlike baseball, but trying to figure out what on earth was going on was fascinating to me. And it still is. And I haven't really, I, I haven't gotten infinitely closer to knowing how to always dig into games and how to watch them and how to understand what's going on. But I'd like to think I've learned a thing or two along the way. And where did you grow up in the U.S., Joe? Yeah, so I'm a native to Phoenix, Arizona, which is where I'm still based now. So it's about to get real hot out here, but I, I do enjoy living here. Similar enough to where I am located now in Dubai, but um, <laughs> okay. would you say Phoenix, it's not quite a soccer hotbed, is it? It depends on how you want to define that term. So if you think about a youth soccer hotbed, I think this is probably right in that category. If you think about a professional soccer hotbed, we're not there right now. Phoenix Rising is our USL team, the second division here in the United States, and they are doing some, some genuinely impressive things in the community and doing some impressive things on the field as well. The quality that they play with is the best in that division or is one of the best in that division. And people are rallying behind it. They're building a new stadium and different things like that. So it's a fascinating development from them. But the infrastructure is still not totally there statewide. It's a big state. There are two professional clubs here in the state and they're not at the size of an MLS club or something like that. So there's a lot of growth still to be done on, on both the youth and professional fronts. But youth-wise, there is a pretty big network of clubs and players out here. Fantastic. And I'm just curious to dive more and explore more about the tactical. And, of course, you speak about strategy. Did that come from being immersed in the game, from watching it, from playing it? Because I can't mm. imagine growing up in Phoenix, although you do say there was a prominent youth development culture, that there would be too much in the way of role models growing up. Yeah, it came from watching for me, not less so playing. I mean, I did play some, not as much as in hindsight I wish I had, but it, it came from watching the game and figuring out, wow, how are all the chess pieces moving? How are they working together? Or how are some operating independently? Things like that. It absolutely came from watching the game and trying to learn more about it and just becoming fascinated and fixated on it at a certain point, less so from my brief and unimpressive playing career. <laughs> and nowadays, what does a common day look like, Joe? I mean, you write for The Athletic. You, you do some work with your own company, 361 Soccer. You co-host the MLS, MLS Assist pod, pod with Jordan Agnelli, which I recommend everybody go listen to. What does a common day look like for Joe Larry? <laughs> oh, every day, well, not every day is different, but a lot of the days are different. 361 isn't around as much now at this point, so that's not as much of a factor, but between TSS and MLS Assist and then writing now, especially with the MLS season kicking up or kicking off soon, it's, it's, a, it's a packed schedule from time to time for sure. So I don't know, yesterday, for example, uh, Wednesday, as we're recording on a Friday morning, my time at least, Wednesday, there were Champions League games and then there were CONCACAF Champions League games as well. And so I'd watched those four games and then prepped for Thursday morning, which is when we were recording a podcast for the Total Soccer Show with myself and a couple other fine folks over there. 
And we, we did that podcast and I ended up editing it and then uh, prepping for an article and then starting to research and write for an article that I'll be writing for The Athletic. And then today will look fairly similar. So it just is oftentimes a different podcast on a different day, but a lot of watching and writing and researching and, and prepping, regardless kind of of what I'm doing, whether that's a podcast or an article, the prep is oftentimes pretty similar. And do you enjoy the multifaceted nature of the role, Joe? I suppose you're doing written, you're producing audio and visual content. Yeah, it, it's fascinating to me, the idea of different types of communication and how to best produce a product, I think is really, really interesting. And so it kind of allows me to scratch multiple itches, right? I, I was writing before I started doing podcasts. And so that the whole podcast thing was absolutely new to me. And it's daunting in a lot of ways. It still is daunting in a lot of ways. There's a lot of things I don't know, but learning how to refine how to how to talk and how to deliver a message verbally instead of written is, is interesting to me. And then the same, how do I refine my writing? So yeah, it does allow me to scratch that. And even with 361, that was that was more video based. And it's, it's not dead, it's just dormant for a little bit right now. That allows me to scratch another itch. So yeah, I, that's a great question. The multifaceted nature is, is certainly appealing to me. And I suppose moving on to your two topics of expertise, Joe, both the MLS and tactical analysis. Where would you say now, approaching the start of the 2021 season, where do MLS teams rank in terms of modernity with the tactical trends that we've been exposed to over the past few years? The elite that's level. really that's really interesting i was just thinking about that the other day and i was hoping to ask someone who i would consider an expert in this or at least go back and forth with someone in that regard and i think i still will but i was mulling it over and thinking you know how up to date is mls on the, the latest tactics and trends in 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 the world in global soccer and it's a really hard question to answer because it's hard to look i mean the league is massive at this point there are 27 teams headed into 2021, split between the East and Western conferences. It's a big league, right? So I think, I think Major League Soccer has a lot of teams or, or has some teams that are very much in tune with what's happening tactically around the world. Coaches who sit around and watch other teams play, who sit around and watch the Champions League games and take notes and, and are paying attention to what's happening. I think LAFC's Bob Bradley is probably one of the better examples of that. He, he's talked openly about how much he watched that Barcelona team under Pep Guardiola when you have Messi and Xavi and Iniesta and Busquets. And, and he's modeled his LAFC team in certain ways around that team. And I'm sure there are more modern examples as well. There are a lot of coaches that fall under the Bob Bradley paying attention to tactics bucket. There's a lot of coaches, though, that don't. And, and really, I think if you ask them and if you were a good friend of theirs would say, I don't really buy this tactics nonsense, right? What I mean, I'm just going to set out my team in the way that makes most sense with the personnel that I have. I'm going to scout the other team and then make some tweaks from there and call it good, right? It's not to say that's that's entirely a bad approach. I think there would be more in-depth work and research that I would do if I was in their shoes, but I'm not a professional soccer coach and they are, right? I think MLS is split. To answer your question, finally, after that long-winded response, I think it's split between coaches who are tactically aware and are, are maybe even hyper-aware tactically, but then there's also a group of coaches that aren't as in tune with what's what's going on globally, and that that can be for better or worse, at least in certain situations. And, I mean, it, it kind of harbors back to that old Jose Mourinho quote, which you mentioned in your piece on Ronald De Boer's Netherlands back in last October, I believe, Joe, where... Mourinho said, it's a lot more harder to create than it is to destroy. And I think it may be, although it may be a bit too reductionist, but we have seen teams revert back to this more simplistic model. No fans in stadiums, perhaps a lot of these teams, you know, if their fans were in stadiums, take, for example, Newcastle United in the Premier League, there's no way in my mind Steve Bruce <laughs> would have lasted until when he did this season. Um, I suppose then in terms of when you're trying to gauge and measure how modern these MLS teams are up there with the likes of your top teams in Europe and top teams in South America, what would be some of the metrics you would be looking at then, Joe, to compare, relatively speaking? Yeah, I think I think first off, and maybe maybe this is because I'm still becoming more comfortable with data and with, with the analytical side of the game, and that's something that I'm very interested in, just still something that I'm learning. 
I think I would start by just a really simple watch of the team. You know, how do they play? How how passive are they? Are they trying to put their foot, you know, on on the ball and trying to play with the ball? Although, I mean, I will say, I don't think I don't think playing a more possession anti Newcastle style. I don't think that's the only way to be modern. I guess because there are still a lot of teams. I mean, yesterday or, or a couple of days ago, we had Porto versus Chelsea in the Champions League, and Porto put in this really intricate defensive game plan that that had a lot of nuance to it right that had a lot of tweaks that move their wide midfielders back and support their fullbacks and have like a 6-2-2-6-3-1 fluid shape that was sometimes man marking a little bit in certain spaces sometimes zonal marking there was a lot of depth to it and, and you can approach the game in a very detailed way defensively Diego Simeone is another example that I, I think does that really well and has done it well with Atletico Madrid this season in Major League Soccer I think starting out and saying, okay, how are these teams trying to play? And, and when you watch a team, you can almost see, is it positioning intentional? Are players just kind of moving around and looking for space, which is not always bad, but you do like to see a team that is a little bit better drilled and how they position themselves off the ball. Metrics wise, though, if you're looking for a team that, that plays this possession Manchester City style of soccer in, in a very modern sense where you're pressing high up the field, you're counter pressing after you lose the ball in the attacking half. And then you're holding on to the ball when you get it back and making those quick passes and all those things. I think looking at uh, pressures per, no, sorry, passes per defensive action, PPDA, is a great metric for the defensive side of things because it, it illustrates how many actions are you letting the other team, uh, how many passes are you letting the other team string together before you're, before you're pressing them or before you're imposing yourselves on them. The lower that number is, the more aggressive you are defensively, which is a very modern trick, right, to be aggressive defensively. Then maybe you look at passes in the final third or passes into the penalty area. That can give you an idea of how much a team is actually controlling possession in important areas instead of just controlling it in their own half. And then if you wanted to look at building from the back, that, that can be a useful metric in terms of passes in your own third. But if you're never being pressed, that could just mean you're a bad team and you've been bunkering for 90 minutes and you just happen to recover the ball there and pass the ball and then you lose it and the cycle repeats, right? But PPDA passes in the final third, things like that, I think are useful in terms of trying to figure out how modern, I guess, to use that cliche, a team's tactical approach is. Fantastic, Joel. And I suspect moving on to the MLS now and beginning in the Eastern Conference, one such team, which will have very low PPDA and high final pass percentage into the final third, will be Gabriel Heinze's Atlanta United who I'm incredibly excited to see how he adapts to American soccer this upcoming season. I mean, this week, they've already played in the CONCACAF Champions League. Very early days yet, Joe. But what are some of the alterations and tweaks Heinz has made to this Atlanta United side? And what can we expect this season? Heinz is going to play a possession-oriented style of play. He's going to roll out... Likely a 4-3-3 shape that is very, very fluid. We saw that against Alavalense in, in the Champions League recently, right? They're going to drop their central defensive midfielder between the center backs in moments. I think they'll only do that when they're facing a front two. So maybe the other team's playing a 4-4-2. If you drop the, the central defensive midfielder in between the center backs, then you have a 3v2 with your two center backs and your, your number six against their front two. And you can pass out of that and circulate the ball a little bit easier, right? That's just one rotation. That is going to be situational. Then you've got the, the, the fullbacks in that 4-3-3 shape that, that may turn into a 3-4-3 with the number six dropping. The fullbacks slash wingbacks then can tuck inside. And we saw this in the Champions League game in Heinze's first game. They, they can move inside. So maybe it's Brooks Lennon and George Bellow or you know whoever those players are. They can tuck inside and the central midfielders, the two number eights, can move outside and just flip flip channels. Or the wingers can move outside. The, the eights can tuck in and the, the fullbacks can move all the way into the middle of the field. It's really fluid. At least that's what we saw in the first game. That's what we'd seen from Hinze at Belay Sarsfield, his last coaching stop in Argentina. So I think it makes sense that we'll continue to see more of those rotations. As far as tweaks, when you look at Frank DeBoer, who was the last, the last, co- the last full-time head coach in Atlanta, I guess not interim head coach is kind of what I'm looking for there. When you look at Frank DeBoer, he was trying to play in a kind of similar way. He tried to use the ball. He's doing the same thing with the Netherlands national team right now. He's trying to get the team to use the ball and pass through pressure and all of that stuff. Hinze wants to do the same thing. But I think the difference is, I mean, and maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong because I haven't seen a ton yet. We're still on a very small sample size. But 
the boy was fired because he couldn't build a culture in that locker room. He couldn't get people on board. That's all the reporting out of Atlanta is that he really struggled to unite that locker room. People didn't like playing for him. Well, at least a lot of people didn't like playing for him. I don't think Keynes is going to have that problem because from what we can tell, he doesn't tolerate that behavior. If you're not bought in, you're, you're gone. At least you're not going to be playing. So I think if Hinze can, can marry his style of soccer, which I think is really entertaining, I think Atlanta had the talent to execute it well. If he can marry that on-field stuff with the off-field stuff in Atlanta, I think he's going to have a much more successful tenure than Frank DeBoer did. I'd have to agree, Joe. I think for me, Atlanta United, a lot of the stuff which is off-field is significantly underappreciated and undervalued. I think if you're able to manage that South American click, We've known they've recruited heavily from South America now for years on pun end. Um, we've seen Tata Martino enjoy success there in Atlanta United, which is yet to have been matched. But I suppose touching on designated players, Joe, and transfers in the offseason, I mean, we've seen Atlanta United go to South America again once more. What DPs should we be most looking forward to watching this season? <laughs> yeah, there have only been... I believe four designated player, new new designated player signings. Actually, I think maybe six now after yesterday, actually, now that I think about it. I think there have been six. The Galaxy have one. Atlanta United has one. Austin FC, the, the expansion team coming into the league this season, has two. And then FC Cincinnati paid and, and brought in two guys as well. I think the big one, if we're talking newcomers, and I know that wasn't specifically your question, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it that. When you look at that squad, last year they were the worst team in Major League Soccer. They've been really bad ever since coming into Major League Soccer as an expansion team a couple of years ago. They've been, they've been terrible. They've gone through a number of different head coaches. Now under Gop Stama, a Dutch manager, they brought in a player named Brenner from Brazil. They paid a club record fee for him, double figures, uh, double figures in, in millions, which is not a common thing in Major League Soccer, certainly. One of, one of the most expensive transfers in the league's history. And he's a young striker. I believe he's 21 coming in from Sao Paulo in Brazil. He had a good scoring record there. Not a giant sample size yet, but that's what you get when you're looking at young talent. He's a guy who moves really well in the box, seems to understand space and could combine really well with Lucho Acosta, another guy that uh, FC Cincinnati's brought in from Liga MX and then DC United before then, almost went to PSG and that all fell apart at the, at the last minute sort of. But it's it's an interesting pairing, right? Lucio Acosta and Brenner, maybe these two players can help Cincinnati actually start to score some goals and create some chances. And then if you're Brenner, maybe finish off those chances. I think he could be certainly a player to watch in addition just to, just to Cincinnati being a team to watch this year. Yeah, I think another team which has, I mean, enjoyed contrast and fortunes to their fellows in Ohio has been certainly the Columbus crew. I mean, those guys, they must be entering the season on a crest of a wave, Joe. I mean, of course, last season winning only their second MLS Cup in their history, moving into a new stadium this summer. I mean, led by Caleb Porter, can they contend once again? Yeah, absolutely they can. They have taken last year's squad and made it better. They added in Bradley Wright Phillips, who was a great goal scorer with the New York Red Bulls and then moved to LAFC for last season. He was, he was out for part of the year. But when he, was, when he was playing, he was very effective for Bob Bradley. And now he's in Columbus as a backup striker to Jossie Zardes. They have two really strong options up top when, when Zardes is off with the U.S. men's national team for various competitions over the summer and in the fall. Bradley Wright Phillips can start, and you don't really have a massive drop-off there. They also brought in Kevin Molino, Trinidad and Tobago man from, um, from Minnesota United. He was playing for Adrian Heath there and combining really well in the final third, creating a lot of wonderful chances for them alongside Emmanuel Reynoso, who are Minnesota brought in from Boca Juniors. They combined really well. And now Molino's got a three-year deal with, with the Columbus crew, and he's a little bit older. But for this season, I think he can come in and really impact that team in a big way. As, uh, the Columbus crew, excuse me, they have so much talent. They have so much depth. They have a way of playing under Caleb Porter. They're in the CONCACAF Champions League. And I think of any MLS team, they're best suited to make a run in that competition. Will they? I don't know. But they have the ability. They have the, the talent to make that run. And they have a talent. They have the talent to make a deep run in MLS Cup and to contend for the Supporter Shield as well in MLS. And I suppose just off topic now, Joe, it might be a weird question, but as the Columbus crew move into the new crew stadium, what is the latest on COVID guidelines in Ohio? Will there be allowed fans for their opener coming up this summer? 
Honestly, I don't know. It's, it's hard to keep up with all of the varying COVID guidelines state by state. I would imagine, because I don't think the stadium's opening, and I'm, I'm, I'm not even sure on this. I don't think the stadium's opening until a couple of months into the season, which, which should be encouraging for crew fans because that will give them a better chance to actually go to that home opener. So I, I would be encouraged, but yeah, I'm not a uh, Ohio political official, so I'm not, not entirely sure on that one. Yeah, of course. I think for those listeners, Joe, that are a bit thrown off by that question and um, might not understand the context given, of course, we look at Columbus Crew and their Arden fan base. Um, it was just only a few years ago, Joe, that um, the crew nearly ceased to exist or they were going to move franchise operations down south. So I think, well, the likelihood, although it may be not great, but the, <laughs> getting to see the crew parade or second MLS Cup in front of those fans would be absolutely terrific way to welcome in the new crew stadium. Um, moving on to Philadelphia, one of my favourite teams to watch last season, led by Jim Curtin. Um, two prominent players for them, the centre-half, Mark McKenzie, and of course, Brendan Aronson, everybody's little favourite, <laughs> diminutive American playmaker. Two huge losses now that those two guys moved on to Genk and Red Bull, Salzburg respectively in Europe. Last season, Joe, they won the supporters' shield. I mean, we've seen in recent years. I mean, I just still don't get the concept. You know, as a European football fan, I still don't get the concept of this supporter shield. Could you um, perhaps explain to our audience? Absolutely. The supporter shield is the, is the Premier League title. It's the La Liga title. It's the best team in the league on points over the course of the season. MLS is, sp- is split into an Eastern Conference and a Western Conference, but there's still some cross-conference play. And so it's not a balanced schedule. So it's, it is a flawed metric, no matter how you look at it. But it, the, the Union last year had more points over the course of the regular season than any other team in MLS. They won the Supporters' Shield. They won the regular season title. That's what it is. But then they go into playoffs, which is which is something that's also you know a familiar concept to European soccer fans. But they go into the playoffs not to be promoted or not to be relegated. They go into the playoffs to win another piece of silverware and, and become MLS Cup champions. And that is more of an American concept, I think. We do we do playoffs and we do champions here in, in the United States. That's how sports work, right? And so MLS kind of combined both, I guess. And last year, the Union won the Supporter Shield. They had the best record, the most points over the course of the regular season. And the crew won MLS Cup. So there is a distinction there, toss in the U.S. Open Cup, the U.S.'s version of the Copa del Rey or, or the FA Cup. Then you toss in CONCACAF Champions League, which is a, a familiar concept. It's just the CONCACAF version of the UEFA Champions League. And there, there are those on other continents as well. There are plenty of competitions, but I can understand how Supporter Shield versus MLS Cup could be confusing for folks. So, I mean, hypothetically speaking, Joe, I'm not going to let this one slide now. <laughs> the goal is, right, to win the MLS Cup at the end of the season through a run in the playoffs. Let's say there is a new expansion team called Joe Larry FC. <laughs> Great name. You have the tw- yeah, you have the 21 season ahead of you. <laughs> <laughs> How would you strategize? I mean, would you go all out at the start of the season, win that supporter shield, knowing that it could mean actually, you know, nothing at all? Or would you, I, I suppose, taper off at the start of the season and then go hell bent come season end? for a big playoff run, like what we've seen the crew done, countless other teams do it in the past few years. You are asking a question that so many other people have asked, and I still don't think we have a definitive answer for. So if, if we're looking at my expansion team, you know, and this is just my view here, I don't know that it represents necessarily the view of, of actual MLS expansion teams or actual MLS teams. I think I honestly don't know how to how to prioritize the Supporters Shield versus MLS Cup. In, in European leagues, it's so easy, right? You go to win the league or you go to win the Champions League. And then the conversation is more about, okay, which of those two do you prioritize? But usually you have the squad depth and the quality to do both. MLS teams right now don't have the money with the way the league is structured. We really don't have the money to be able to be deep enough to go after the Shield and to go after the Cup and to go after CCL. So I think... I think MLS Cup has, you know, more fan backing. I think because it's more of an American concept, that playoff, you know, that playoff tournament, I think that's more of an American concept and probably has more value to the average fan. But in terms of actually being the best soccer team over the course of a year, 
which is kind of what I would like my team to be, you know, just dominating other teams on the pitch. Joe Lowry FC has become the most fun team to watch in Major League Soccer. I can see the headlines now. Maybe I'll write that headline. That might be a conflict of interest. I probably won't. But I think I would like to see a, a team that is the best over the course of the entire year. And the Union last year were the best over the course of the year, and they deserve respect for that. I've talked to coaches in the past that kind of echo that viewpoint. They, they say, you know, the best team is the team that has the best record over the course of the regular season, right? The playoffs is so random. The playoffs, you know, one, one fluke goal can happen and you're out and you could have been the best team for six months, seven months, eight months, and it doesn't matter at that point. So I don't know if that was said by coaches who just were scared of a playoff atmosphere that they might lose that, that best record, which I can understand. But I, I think Joe Lowry FC is gunning for the shield. And if, if all else goes to plan, we'll win that and a few other competitions as well. It's very much what came first, Joe, the chicken or the egg. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, and then to close on the Eastern front, are there any other storylines from any of the other participating teams, perhaps Inter-Miami entering their second season under Phil Neville, that we should be following for the upcoming season? Inter-Miami is a fascinating one. They, as you said, are coached by Phil Neville, owned by David Beckham. They have currently four designated players on their roster, which is illegal in MLS. They need to figure out how to move one of them in order to avoid some sort of sanctioning. I don't really, this is kind of unprecedented. It happened with the Galaxy a few years ago, but it, it doesn't happen a lot. So Inter Miami, just how, how are they going to play? What's going to happen with their roster is a big storyline. And then just new coaches coming into the league. There's a lot of new coaches that have have changed teams or, or come into MLS. Chris Armas moving from the Red Bulls to Toronto FC after he was fired. Last year in New York, you got Gerhard Struber, former RB Salzburg guy and, and former manager of Barnsley, who came to, to manage the Red Bulls at the very end of last year, now getting his first full season. You've got a bunch of other co- Montreal has a new head coach, Thierry Henry's out. They, they appointed Wilfred Nancy off of their staff. DC United has Hernan Losada coming over from Belgium. There are a lot of, of vacancies that were filled this offseason. I think following how those coaches do and how those teams do is going to be something that I'm certainly doing over the course of this season. And moving on from the east to the west, we have the Cascadia duopoly of Seattle Sounders and Portland Timbers. Seattle Sounders under coach Brian Smetzer showing unbelievable consistency throughout these past few years. How are they looking again, Joe, for another title charge upon the west this season? They're in a little bit of a tough spot right now relative to where they were a year ago because Jordan Morris is out with an ACL tear. He was on loan at Swansea City. This was going to be his chance to make that big European move that a lot of folks have been waiting for him to make for years now. He was one of the best attackers, one of the best wide attackers in MLS last season, and he's been one of the best over the last couple of years. And he goes to Swansea, he's starting to play, he's starting to get some minutes off the bench, coming in for Jamal Lowe. And then he tears his ACL in a game there and it's bad. And so he's, he's no longer really pursuing that European venture right now, certainly. And he's not able to play for Seattle either. So they're missing a, a default starter in, in one of their top goal scorers this year, but they still have talent. They still have Nico Ladero, Raul Rui Diaz, Joao Paulo, Freddie Mann. I mean, they have talented players, players who can score, players who can create chances. It's just going to be a little bit more of a challenge for Brian Smetzer to figure out how to how to set up his team. Maybe we see a change in shape. How do they approach games without Jordan Morris? That's, that's going to be really interesting headed into 2021, but yeah, sure. They can still totally challenge for a number of different trophies this year. They're still that good. And having attended games at Seattle's ground, having attended games myself down in Portland and all over the U S you can see there's a tremendous soccer culture, a tremendous fan culture over there, Joel. I'm curious, how much do you think, I mean, in your own opinion, have been the likes of Seattle Sounders, Portland Timbers being affected by empty stadiums? Yeah, I I don't know how much they've been affected. I mean, this has kind of been a broad discussion in global in global soccer, right? How how does the atmosphere affect performance? How are home teams affected? Is that advantage gone? Do away teams have a bigger advantage away from home? And I think there have been some academic papers written on this that would provide certainly better insight than insight than I do. But if we're looking at natural home field advantages in Major League Soccer, because that's kind of the the root of this, right? Seattle at uh, the name of their their stadium now is escaping me after they changed it from Central Link Field. It it doesn't matter a whole lot, but their atmosphere is is incredible, right? The Seattle fans come and they they pack a large portions of the Seattle Seahawks NFL stadium. 
they come in and it's loud. It's really loud in there. They play on turf, which is difficult for teams who aren't used to it either. It's, it's a tough place to come and play. Same with Portland. They pack Providence Park in Portland. It's a great located stadium. It's in a great spot in Portland. Fans come and they, they pack it. They just expanded that stadium to fit more people. And now they can, they can come in when it's not a global pandemic and they can make it really loud and really hard to play against. I believe there's some sort of artificial surface there as well. They have two of the best home field advantages in MLS, two of the best, they're two of the best supported clubs. When you lose the ability to have your fans backing you in your stadium, I think, yeah, I think it makes it harder, at least mentally, for a lot of these guys. I think in Europe, we tend to have an underappreciation of the exact fan culture in the US, Joke. I think, fortunately speaking for myself, I've been very lucky to have attended the Champions League final attended the European Championships, uh, Copa America games, games all over the continent of Europe. But for me, as I said to my close friends and brothers the whole time, probably the most memorable match day experience I've ever had was LAFC's inaugural game in the 2019 mm. season up in Seattle, which was, or 2018 season up in Seattle, which was an absolutely unforgettable experience. And Seattle's neighbours, Joe Portland Timbers, they're, <laughs> for all those data quants, they're the elephant in the room, so to speak, led by Giovanni Savarese. They're coming off the back of a Jekyll and Hyde season. They've won the MLS's back tournaments, but they have an aging squad. They've overperformed metrics consistently now for a while. What areas and what alterations can we expect to see Savarese make, if even at all this season? First of all, uh, the Seattle Sounders play at Lumen Field. I, rem I remember that after I'd already given up trying to remember. So I just had to get that out there. Not that really anyone cares about that, but now I feel better. You know, I think for, for the Portland Timbers, for Savarese, I really don't expect them to make any changes headed into 2021. Savarese usually plays a 4-2-3-1. He likes to absorb pressure and attack quickly. Sometimes they'll possess and use Diego Valerian, Sebastian Blanco, and a little bit of Eric Williamson and Jeremy Apobasi to create in the final third but they don't have this LAFC-esque detailed possession structure. They're not trying to break you down with the ball all the time, or if they are, they're not always capable of doing that. So yeah, the Timbers are going to sit back. They're going to absorb pressure, probably defend in a 4-4-2 block and go for it. They're missing Sebastian Blanco right now. He should be back soon in, in rehabbing from an ACL tear that he suffered last season. But yeah, it's going to look like the same old Savarese Timbers headed into 2021. It remains to be seen whether or not, as you said, you know, their, their metrics are going to catch up with them because they haven't been statistically one of the better teams in MLS, even though they've had a pretty solid record, certainly last season. I mean, for me on a personal level, it's going to be a very tough job for Gavin Wilkinson, GM of the Timbers, to help rebuild that squad with Savarese. Hmm. For me, it's a major reconstruction they need to do. How do you replace two legends like Blanco yeah. and Valeri when they do eventually leave? I mean, have there been any, I suppose, rumors or murmurs about succession planning there, Joe? I haven't heard anything. And I'm not this plugged in insider, but I haven't even heard other people reporting or, or talking about this. That's actually, you know, maybe I should have been thinking about this, but that's really the first time I've thought about what, come next, what comes next for Portland. They have Valero, they have Blanco, as you mentioned. They also have Diego Chara, who's an aging central defensive midfielder for them. He's been their most important player for the last umpteen years now. He's been huge for them. And you're coming up to a point in time in Portland Timbers history where you're going to lose all three of those players over the next couple of seasons at the most. So yeah, how do you how do you build from within? Portland don't develop youth players, really. They haven't invested in developing the next Diego Chara or the next Diego Valeri. They've said, yeah, we're, we're going to be smart with our international acquisitions. We're going to grab a couple of domestic players as well and roll the dice from there. And that's kind of put them in a little bit of a bind for future planning here. So yeah, it's going to be fascinating to watch how that squad changes and evolves over the next couple of years. It's going to be tough for Wilkinson. I, I think you're spot on with that. And then moving on to everybody's favorite neutral team, I suppose, if you could say neutral team in the West, LAFC, Bob Bradley's LAFC, which we've already remarked upon. I mean, as we spoke about earlier on in the show, Joe, about, I mean, Joe's Mourinho, he said before, it's a lot more difficult to create than it is to destroy do you see Bob Bradley at any stage, at any point of this season, sacrificing some control, being perhaps a bit more pragmatic to improve the LAFC's fortunes? No, because I think, and I'd, I'd love to talk about this with Bob Bradley at some point. Um, I, I, the, my answer to that question is no, because I think Bob Bradley thinks, you know, control is having the ball. 
I think he, he doesn't think control is getting numbers back in your own half in a Jose Mourinho-esque defensive block. I think he thinks we're safer when we have possession because that means the other team doesn't have possession. I think Bob Bradley thinks pra- being pragmatic is controlling the ball so that the other team doesn't. And that's the most logical way to do things. It's harder. Sure. And I don't think you would deny that, but I think that is where Bob Bradley sees control and pragmatism coming from. It's from possession and from aggressive defensive pressure and from playing what we would think of as a more risky style of soccer. So now I don't really see Bob Bradley changing. He played a four, three, three, every single game last season, they pressed high. They, they passed the ball around in the attacking third and they played directly at times with Diego Rossi, especially on that left side, and, and Brian Rodriguez sometimes coming into that front three. And then you have Carlos Vela, who's, of course, extremely, extremely talented, even though he missed sections of last year. This is going to be the same old Bob Bradley LAFC team, and I, for one, am excited to watch him in 2021. Likewise, I mean, you always have to admire a guy, especially working at the elite level of football, that will stick by his principles. For me, Joe, and it's not just me that's going to say it, I think it's a crime against U.S. soccer that the LAFC did not actually win the MLS Cup in 2019. Hmm. Some other football they played with the two free-roaming number eights in midfield, one of them being Latif Blessing. It was an absolute joy to watch. Yeah. Outside of Seattle, Portland and LAFC, are there any other contenders or storylines which we should be tuning into in the West? Yeah, I think the Galaxy are a really interesting project. And I guess we're staying in L.A. in a certain way there, a little bit outside of L.A., if we're being honest. But the Galaxy brought in Greg Vanny, Toronto FC's head coach. So Toronto gets Chris Armas. The Galaxy fired Guillermo Barcelotto and bring in Greg Vanny, who's played a totally different style in the past than Shaloto played with the Galaxy. You know, the last iteration when Ibrahimovic was there and even after was the Galaxy just play a bunch of crosses into the box. They try to, to drive the ball forward and then lump it in, right? It, it's very simplistic. It was very reductive. Now with Greg Vanny, they're going to hold on to the ball a lot more because that's how Greg Vanny has played. He wants to possess. He wants to use the ball to break down the opponent. And the Galaxy have the midfield talent. Maybe they don't have necessarily the, the central defense to play out of the back, but they certainly have the ability to control possession in higher areas once they build a little bit. They have... Mexican international Jonathan Dos Santos. They have Efra Alvarez, a really talented young dual national Mexican-American. They have Sebastian Legette, who's a, a starter for the U.S. men's national team right now, or he has been. And he's a really creative player. Sasha Kleschian, Victor Vasquez, who Benny brought back um, after he'd been at Toronto for some time as well and had been a part of those really good Toronto FC teams. So they have a lot of talent. And then the guy I haven't mentioned yet is Chicharito, who really struggled last season under Scalotto and now could be suited for a much better season because of the tactical style that Manny's going to play, that is going to be fascinating to watch. How does this team play? How quickly can they adopt Manny's principles? And then does Chicharito start scoring goals? Then he didn't really do that last year. All of those things are going to be really interesting in 2021. There's been a lot of discussion recently, Joe, about Efren Alvarez and which country is going to declare for Mexico or the U.S. Either way, you know, rest assured, we have a generational talent on our hands here. Do you see this being a crucial season in his development under Vanny? I'm sure we have a lot of teams in Europe watching. Yeah, it's, it feels like this has got to be the year, or it feels like this, this can be the year. I struggle to, to say this has to be, or this, you know, if he doesn't perform this year, then he's a failure because he's still such a young player, right? He's still, still trying to figure out life and and soccer is just one part of that. And so I have some sympathy for, for young talent and and how those players develop and how challenging that can be. But the stars seem to have aligned in this instance, you've got Greg Vanny coming in. That's going to play a way that, that suits Efra Alvarez way better than, than the previous manager's style did. And he's got talent around him that he's going to have to compete with every single day in training to even get on the field. And I think this is a case of iron sharpening iron. It's going to be challenging minutes are certainly not going to be handed to Efra Alvarez, but he can play in multiple spots. He can play as a 10. He can play as a, as a right winger cutting inside on his left foot. He's got some versatility in terms of where he can be used and how he can be used. But yeah, I think he's set for a good year under Greg Vanny. I believe in Efra Alvarez. I believe in the talent that he has. I think he's one of the most talented kids in MLS right now. And this could be the year where we see that all come together. And sticking on the topic of youth development, Joe, I mean, for you see this generation, this plethora, 
of US men's national team um, players coming through at the moment. For any young player coming through the ranks, do you still believe MLS is the best, most suitable environment for them to develop in? Or at a young age, 16, 17, 18, do you still believe that move to Europe, which is coveted amongst them, is the best route forward for their development? It depends on the player, right? It depends on, on what, what suits them best on an individual basis. You look at a guy like Brendan Aronson. He came up and played a full season and started a full season with the union before he made that move. Where as you look at a guy like Gio Reyna or Chris Richards, they left before they played a single senior minute with NYCFC or with FC Dallas in their areas, right? They were on homegrown deals with those teams, but they moved because that was the right situation. They had an opportunity to go and they wanted to pursue it. Brendan Aronson or James Sands with NYCFC or Paxton Pomacall with FC Dallas, all hugely talented players. I am hoping, you know, for, for Pomacall's sake and for Sands' sake, that they're able to stay healthy and make that move if they if they want to. But I think there are a lot of different pathways, and that's that's been encouraging to watch, actually, from an American perspective. You know, there are being there are players being produced and playing in MLS who then go and, and start for a team like RB Salzburg. There are players who can who can play a, a full year and then go in and make that move at the right time. And there are players who can leave before they've ever played a certain minute with a senior team here in MLS or, or even in USL. We're going to start seeing that a little bit more in the second division here in the U.S. So there are lots of different paths. I struggle to say one is inherently better for or better than the other based on every single situation. I think it does fall down more to the individual. And long may it continue. I mean, we've seen Greg Berhalter go in there as U.S. men's national team manager ahead of Qatar 22. And although the results have been mixed, you can see he's tried already to impose a style upon the team. How has Berhalter managed to do it in such, I suppose, a confined time frame? It's, man, I'm not so sure it is. And I guess I don't want to push back entirely against your question here, but it's been... It's been more than two years since Berhalter's taken over this program. He took over, actually, I think at the end of 2018, and his first camp was in January of 2019. Fast forward, yeah, you have 2020, which is kind of a wash. But you fast forward till now, and it's been two and a half years, right, into April of 2021, as we're talking right now. He's gone through a couple different iterations They've, in terms of tactical approaches, from my vantage point, at least. They started out in, yeah, we're gonna control the ball, we're gonna break down the opposition. And that's stayed true. That has been a constant thread. But defensively at the start of his tenure, they sat back and were much more reactionary in terms of how they approached games. They sat in the 4-4-2 mid block and in absorb pressure and then tried to control possession and build again from there. Now in 2021, and this really started in 2020 in, in a brief game before the pandemic really hit, they play a 4 through 3 almost Liverpool-esque high press, and then they possess out of that shape. So there have been changes, but I think the biggest thing that's happened is actually not, as much as I love diving into the tactics, it's the development of the player pool. The player pool right now is night and day to what it was when Prothor took over in 2019. I think there were some poor personnel selections along the way, waiting for that personnel to really develop in that talent and the player pool to really deepen and, and strengthen at the top end especially. But now in 2021, Berhalter can pick from, from three players to put in a central midfield of Tyler Adams, Weston McKenney, Yunus Musa, and Sebastian Legette. Four really talented players, three guys over in Europe, one in MLS, and they all have the ability to start and to a lot of times to interchange and rotate in midfield. The player pool has gotten so much better, and, and Berhalter is now, I think, kind of coming into his own tactically and, and really settled on what he wants this team to look like. Now, will the team hold up in important games? Can the team play toe to toe with Mexico? And, and can the team really stamp? their style on World Cup qualifying in the fall. That all still remains to be seen. I think in defense of Berhalter, I had Ben Littleton, who wrote the book on Edge recently on the show, Joe, and he spoke about how these soft skills in football, they're so much underappreciated, such as adaptability and cohesion, which rings most truest at the international level when you have probably four, five, six timeframes at most during the year in which you can gather these guys together. However, what's always weirded me out on the way through no fault of their own in the US has been the compartmentalization of the player pool, so to speak. You will have meetups for the American contingent two, three times a year. That will be segmented another two times a year for the European guys. And then they'll probably all get together at, at the very most two, three times on a yearly basis. And I think what we've seen from Beralter, of course, enforcing these tactical 
styles upon his team over the past few years has been obviously a lot of it is trial and error. Peralta has never struck me as an international team manager. I think he's a guy who's more suited to the day-to-day -day affairs at running the club like he did at the crew so successfully. But it will be interesting to see their development over the coming 18 months. And I, for one, think if they do make it to Qatar, they, they won't be a dark horse to win it by all, no stretch of the imagination. But I think they'll be liable to cause a few upsets. Now, finally, to close, Joe, I'm not going to let you off the leash lightly. I need some predictions, <laughs> sure. I need some predictions for the upcoming season. OK? <laughs> all right. Right. First one, MVP. MVP. Oh, man. I'm going to go with Carlos Vela. I feel like, how, oh, okay, I'm, I'm a bit torn. I'm, be I'm torn between Carlos Vela and Joseph Martinez. Those are the two safest picks. But Martinez is coming off of an ACL injury. Yeah, he's younger than Vela. But I'm going to say Carlos Vela. I think this is another year where he's going to be the same Carlos Vela we've seen for the last couple of years. I, I'm hoping he can, he can save off father time a little bit here and have another really dominant season in, in LA, just so that my prediction can be right. Brilliant. Breakthrough star. Breakthrough star. I love this one. I think, man, we talked about him already. I think this is, or this could be the year for Efra Alvarez. Coming in, he's, he is one of the most talented guys in MLS. We talked about it already. All the stars have aligned for him to have a successful season. I'm going to bank on this being the year where that happens. Coach of the year. Mm, coach of the year. I'm trying to think through different, different options that may be a little bit more under the radar. Um, let me see. I'm going to look at the standings here for a split second. I think in, in the East, man, you're looking at a lot of the same, a lot of the same coaches that we've seen have success in the past, right? You're looking at Caleb Porter, who had a really great, oh, that's the answer. Never mind. I don't need to go any deeper than that. I think Caleb Porter, with how stacked the crew are, he's kind of the, the shoe in. Not an under the radar pick, but certainly, certainly a strong pick. I'm going to go with Caleb Porter. And do you fancy Caleb Porter's crew team to reign once again in the East? Yeah, no, I do. I think that's the prediction I made actually earlier on in the off season, just a couple of weeks ago. I think they're the strongest team in the East. They're they're the favorite to do that. Will they? I don't know, but that's that's what I'm going with. Yeah, the West. I've got LAFC in the West. Not that could be a bad prediction, but statistically, they've been one of the best teams in the league for the last couple of years now. Last year was a bit of an off year output wise for them, but they still have so much talent, even without Brian Rodriguez. They have so much quality. It's hard for me to bet against them this year. And in the unlikelihood, Joel Lowry FC do not make it through the playoffs. <laughs> who is going to be this year's MLS Cup champions? You know, I think if, if we learned anything in MLS over the last few years, it's that betting on any team other than the Seattle Sounders to at least be in MLS Cup is a bad call. So I'm going to bank on the Sounders not only being in MLS Cup, but actually winning it and continuing their, their streak of making it to that game. And I'm, I'm going to say they're going to win it in 2021. Brilliant. And I suppose for one more soundbite, final soundbite from yourself, Joe. Of course, you've been doing some fantastic tactical analysis now for quite some time, which it's been a pleasure to follow your development over these past few years. For those aspiring bloggers, podcasters, tactical analysis out there, would you have any advice for them? Yeah, do, do things. And I guess this applies to a broader audience than just tactical analysis, but it, you know, do things that you're passionate about, learn things like, like pursue projects that you are excited about, learn about areas that are interesting to you and maybe learn a couple other things along the way. If you're interested in tactics, watch a game and, and maybe watch it in a different way. Maybe focus on one player, maybe focus on one line. How are players interchanging? Just do things that are interesting and do things that people haven't done before. Branch out, be a little bit creative in how you're looking at the game. I know that's hard to do because I'm not giving any specifics on that, but you know, roll, roll around with different ideas, play around with different ideas and create something that is not entirely common. There's a lot of folks now doing tactical analysis, which is awesome, but it also makes it hard to differentiate yourself. So maybe talk about tactics, tactics in a different way. Maybe look at the game in a little bit of a different way and create something that not a lot of people have done. So that's my, that is my advice to folks. And I'm still trying to follow that myself. It's not always easy, but I think that is a sound piece of advice, or at least I hope it is. I think you're well on your way there anyways, Joe. But um, listen, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you once again. Um, I mean, Joe, where's best for people to catch you online? Yeah, at Joe C. Lowry on Twitter, J-O-E-C-L-O-W-E-R-Y is the best place. I've got links to all of the stuff that I'm working on or I'll, I'll post anything that I think is cool over there. That's probably the best place to go. 
guys make sure to check him out been an avid subscriber from day one from the mls assist pod total soccer show absolutely everything joe i really love your content keep up the great work and i'm sure as the mls season gets up and running we'll be sure to have you on again in the near future connor thank you so much for having me i really appreciate it no problem take care joe you too